Good afternoon, guys. This is Chemistry 105, and our class normally meets from 9.35 to 10.55 on Tuesday and Thursday. And since we are not having class tomorrow, January 16th, 2024, due to the snow, and many of you are not even on campus yet, I've created a video so that we are not behind. I am Miss Brooks. A little bit about me, I retired in 2021 after teaching at Western for 23 years, and I was asked to come back in the fall of this past semester and felt like that was a great opportunity for me to do that. So I've come back to teach for this school year and don't know that I'll be here next school year, but I'm actually glad to be here. I have a lot in common with many of you. You've grown up on a farm, some of you. You're ag major, some of you. I also grew up on a farm, and I have a farm. I raise cattle and goats. I have about um, 36 head of cattle, and we have 41 goats. And I am a Christian, and I try to let that show in my actions and how I speak to you all and how I talk to you. So I think we're going to have a great semester. Looking forward to meeting all of you and seeing you in class. I'm going to go ahead and treat today as a normal class period, even though it is on video. I hope you will treat it the same and go ahead and have your notes printed out before you watch any more of this video. If you don't have them printed, go ahead and stop and go get those. And also make sure you have... Um, a calculator, you won't have to have that exactly today, but you will need it when we meet on Thursday. So let's get started. We're going to go over the syllabus first. And you can see here, and you also know I've sent several emails out to you already, put several announcements on Blackboard concerning the prerequisite of math. And as you look at the syllabus, and I actually see a mistake here on the syllabus that I need to fix, but you can add it right now. It's not a big deal. You need to have had or be signed up for Math 116 or Math 115. So Math 115 or Math 116 or above. And I do suggest that if you are only taking Math 115 or 116 E, along with Math 105, these are both math courses, not the chemistry course I'm talking about, but if you're in these math courses currently with the E behind them, I would strongly encourage you to get that math over with before you take chemistry. Students that have signed up for just the standard Math 116 or Math 115 currently should be fine. If you have any questions individually, please send me an email or ask, but it's crucial that you understand math and that you have good math skills. If you don't have good math skills, then your chemistry grade will suffer. I've been doing this a long time and I have enough experience to not to know the fact that if you don't have good math skills, it's going to be very hard to do chemistry and I don't want you failing. I want you to succeed. You can see here a little bit about the goals of our course. I'm not going to read that to you. You can do that on your own. This is, I will mention, this is a course for strict, mainly agriculture and consumer and family science majors, as well as, and I'll list these on here, and I've sent you numerous emails. If you are not in construction management, agriculture, nutrition, consumer and family sciences, or any of these majors, then please check your plan of courses, your course plan with your major and make certain that you actually need Chemistry 105 and 106 lab. I don't want you taking a course that you shouldn't be in. So double check that, please. All right, you do not have to buy a book for this course. It's a free textbook, and to be quite honest with you, I doubt if you'll ever even pick up, or, or there's nothing to pick up, I doubt if you'll ever even look anything up on the textbook. You actually have access to two free textbooks. I've given you the website for both of those. The syllabus will show you the chapters for this first one. If you want more extra practice work than what I've given you, you can go here. Honestly, don't think anybody looked at a book last semester. 
you will have Achieve homework, and this is something that you will be purchasing either with Big Red Backpack, which is $72 with Big Red Backpack. If you did Big Red Backpack for this course, it would be $72, and it automatically is paid for you. If you opt out of Big Red Backpack, then you will be you will continue getting to work on Achieve Homework as you have been all semester. But around week four or five, somewhere in that time frame, you will actually be requested to pay the approximately $65 before you can continue using Achieve. And so just keep that in mind. If you opted out of Big Red Backpack, you will end up having to pay, but there's nothing you need to do until they tell you to pay, other than opting out of Big Red Backpack, of course. Calculator, you do need a calculator for this class. You will need a non-programmable scientific calculator. You may not use your cell phone. You may not use a graphing calculator. This is my favorite calculator, the TI-30XA. It does um, only have a single line display. You only have the single line, so you cannot do the double line that some of you are used to on a graphing calculator. If you want a calculator with a double line display, then you would want the TI-30X2S. Those are the two best calculators. I stay away from Casio's simply because they're not as easy to use. In my experience, these Texas Instruments are the best. You can get those for about $10 to $12 at Walmart, Staples. They're going to cost you a lot more than that at the bookstore. Your calculator also will um, not, you will not be allowed to keep the cover on during test. You also must have a pencil. I will be using a pen giving notes, but if I were taking the notes, I would definitely be using a pencil. I would not be using a pen. The appropriate course conduct I want you to treat people like you want to be treated. And I don't think any of us like to be treated rudely, meanly, harshly. Um, I, I will say there have been students in the past who have said that I yell in class. I don't yell in class. I talk loudly. But I think most people are going to acknowledge once you actually see me in class that I get excited about what I'm teaching. I'm passionate about what I'm teaching. I'm not at all upset while I'm teaching. I am too loud, and I try to get a little quieter. And so um, point being, I want to treat you with utmost respect, and I will exhibit honesty and openness with you all, and I expect you to do the same with me. You will never hear me cussing in class, and I do not want to hear you cussing in class. That's not something that I um, do anywhere, and I don't want to do it in class, and I don't want to hear you do it either. As far as phone use, you may not use your phone in class once class has started. If I see your phone out, I will call you out. If your phones continue to stay out, then I may lower your entire grade, a letter grade. I haven't had any troubles last semester with students disobeying this rule. I don't expect troubles this semester at all. Obviously, you cannot have any cell phones, notes, or other materials out during lectures. And as far as just real quickly, I know some of you think that you need to have a computer or laptop or that is a computer um, iPad or something to take notes. I do not, well, I don't see any need for it, just to put it bluntly. I've never had a student that can take notes on a computer or an iPad any better than you can take notes on paper. I give you everything you need. All you need to do is print them out and bring a pencil. Unless you have an extenuating circumstance or can give me a very compelling reason to have your computer or laptop or tablet, I mean, out, then you will not be allowed to have any electronic devices out in class. So I know that may be old school for you. Honestly, in my um, evaluations last semester, everybody was like, hey, I love how she gives notes. I wish everybody did it that way. So I think you'll find it easy the way I do it if you'll just stick with my program. Grading. Um, Achieve is the homework platform that we are using, and it is graded homework. You'll have eight assignments, two for each exam. 
Each is worth 15 points. Pay attention to due dates. I may or may not remind you of due dates. I'll show you where those are in a minute. Um, in addition, there is ungraded paper homework available on Blackboard if you want extra practice. There is no reason on earth for you to feel like you don't have enough practice to do in this class. There are four 100-point exams. Most of those are going to be multiple choice. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, I made every exam multiple choice last semester, so I really need to fix this. They're only going to be multiple choice, no short answer questions. They obviously are doing calculations, but it's going to be multiple choice exams. Exams are going to cover the lecture material and your homework. And the missed exams, this is important, missed exams are allowed to be made up only if I am notified prior to your absence and you have an acceptable, verifiable excuse. You cannot tell me at 2 o'clock in the afternoon after you missed your exam at 9.35, oh, Ms. Brooks, I'm sorry, I overslept. That is not a verifiable and proper excuse, acceptable excuse, so you would not get to take the exam. If you send me an email during the exam, let's say you send me an email at 10 o'clock and your exam started at 9.35, and you said, oh, Ms. Brooks, I'm so sorry, I know we have a test today, but I'm at home sick, then that's fine. You let me know before we finish the exam and we can make it up. Obviously, you would have to have proof, doctor's excuse, or something that you were truly ill. So if we have any questions on that, let me know, um, and I can go over that in more detail if you need it. The final exam is actually test four, and it will be held the day of the final exam along with 50 points of comprehensive questions for that total being 150. So it still is four 100-point exams and then a 50-point comprehensive final, if you want to call it that. It's just that the fourth exam is the day of the final, and it's 150 because it includes the 50 points of comprehensive. Your total points for the semester is 570 points. You are responsible for keeping up with your grade. I will post um, grades on Blackboard. As far as calculating your grades, though, you can do that by simply taking the total points you have earned, dividing by the total possible points you could have earned at that point, and here is my grading scale to know what letter grade you would have. I expect you to be in class. However, if you are not in class, that's on you. I'm not planning on creating videos for every lecture. By any means, I will not be doing that. I'm only doing that today because I wanted us to stay on track with our scheduling. And so this is an unusual situation. As far as help, if you need chemistry help, we have several avenues for getting you help. We have the Chemistry Tutoring Center, which will probably be open next week. It is in Kelly Thompson Hall, 1015. It's on the main floor when you walk in the building. We also have the Learning Center, which is in DSU. And if you need other help, life sometimes is really hard. I've listed two other places for you to get counseling and other help that you may, or someone you may know, needs. And so let me know if I can help you in any way. I know that um, life can be hard and school can be stressful. And I think there are a lot of op times our students don't take opportunities to get the help that they need. So I hope that you do that. All right, how do you pass this class? I'm not going to read this to you. This is on you to read. Same thing for the discrimination. If you are a student with a disability, you should have already sent me your form. If not, please do so and then make an effort. This is important for those of you that have a faculty notification letter. You need to reach out to me after class on Thursday and say, or come by before class on Thursday and say, Miss Brooks, I want to go over my accommodations. That is on you. If I do not hear from you, then you will be taking our test as normal. I have reached out to a few of you that have these and I haven't heard from you. So if you have a, an FNL, you need to touch base with me, please. As far as academic dishonesty is concerned, I am a stickler for catching cheating. When you take your exam, that's why you will not have a case on your calculator because I know that this is a perfect place to put an index card 
and I don't want you to cheat. So you cannot have the case. <clears throat> I also will um, have the test set out before you come into the classroom. You will only be allowed to bring in a pencil and a calculator without a case. You will not be able to have cell phones out. Cell phones will be turned off. You will not be allowed to wear your smart watches. And I look very closely at water bottles, etc. Hats have to be off, etc. You know what? Being honest is the best policy. If you don't know it, you don't know it. You fail, you fail. That's on you. You weren't prepared. Be honest with yourself and don't don't cheat yourself. I, I, I cannot stand dishonesty and cannot stand lying. So just be honest. That's all I can say. And that cheating also, let me just, let me make a point here. Cheating is letting someone else do your homework, okay? Don't let someone else do your homework for you. Helping each other on homework means you maybe don't understand how to do a problem, so you have a friend who does understand it. So a friend shows you the method. They don't do the exact problem you have. Again, you don't know it and you cheat. It's on you. Ultimately, you're 30 years old, lying in bed, saying, man, what an idiot I was because I cheated. Hopefully, that's not you. Hopefully, you're going to be honest. All right. This information, this is something that I've added to the syllabus more recently. This information needs to be memorized by the first exam. You don't have cheat sheets, nor do I allow you to create or use them for exams. You're going to need to know these conversion factors. I'll explain the whole exact, not exact later. Right now, if you have not started memorizing these, start. And what I mean by that is memorize. One milliliter is one centimeter cubed. One inch is 2.54 centimeters. Three feet in a yard. Honestly, you should have known many of these. I feel like you come into class knowing the majority of this information. If you don't, then you have a lot more to memorize. If you do not know that one pound is 16 ounces of dry weight, one gallon is four quarts, etc., then you have to relearn that or learn it. Hopefully, though, there are only a few of these that are actually new to you. As far as metric system is concerned, we are going to spend a lot of time learning math skills and basically doing a lot of calculations. That's probably where I spend more time than anything is on calculations in this course. And one of the things that I've discovered over my years of teaching is that students have been taught metric system for years, but they actually do not understand the metric system. They don't know how to convert within the metric system. So I have created a system of conversions and how that works. I've told you here how it works right now, though. I'm just going to tell you up front, memorize these prefixes. Literally memorize kilo, hecto, deca, base, deci, centi, milli, space, space, micro, space, space, nano. Literally memorize it exactly like that, saying that exact space, space, etc. Kilo, hecto, deca, base, deci, centi, milli, space, space, micro, space, space, nano. Memorize that, and then you'll be able to solve any, any metric conversion problem that we have. So, last thing before we get to the schedule. I sent this out and I found out later my um, URL did not work for this. The link wasn't active. You can find this information though on Blackboard if you did not find that you could click on this and that was uh, my mistake. But I have posted on Blackboard the periodic table you need to know and it's under le classroom lecture material. You'll find it the first tab. And something that I know people get confused at, but I, I tried to tell you 10 times here, the symbols that have the mark within the box are the ones you need to know. So know everything that has a mark. So you need to know all of these, these, everything here that has an X, you do need to know Everything here that has the marks, you do need to know. Know what has a mark. That's what you need to know. When I say you need to know them, what do I mean? I mean, if I write CO, you know that is cobalt. If you write sodium, 
I would know that the symbol for sodium is in A. Now, when I write the symbol for sodium, and when you write the symbol for sodium, you need to print, and the N would be capital N, and the A is a lowercase a. If I see this as the symbol for sodium, I will count it wrong. Even if I see that as the symbol for sodium, typically I would count that wrong. It's best to print both letters, make the big letter, the capital letter, bigger than the lowercase letter. I've also had students in the past, especially my engineering students, construction management, that want to write like this, and they say, well, that's how I write everything. Well, it's not correct. This is a capital A that happens to be small. Write them properly. And now you're going to say, man, she's picky. Yes, she's picky. Why am I picky? Because why in the world would I waste time allowing you to do something that's incorrect? Why would I let you be wrong on something? I'm not a good teacher if I let you do something wrong. That's not good teaching. And so I want you to do things correctly. I also want you to spell your symbols and elements correctly. Fluorine is probably the most misspelled element. It's fluorine, and I try to say it so that you know fluorine. It's not flowering. It's F-L-U-O, fluorine, fluorine. So here's fluorine right here over. Now, if you haven't noticed on this periodic table, the names are written. The names are here, they are written, so you do have proper spelling on this periodic table. I have also posted a completely empty periodic table, empty of marks, not empty of, of symbols and elements, but empty of marks with names so that you can mark your own periodic table without all the lines. You might want to do a color coding or something like that, and that's fine if you choose to do that. So you have plenty of periodic tables on Blackboard that you have access to. Once again, I'm going to write it down here. Know every element and symbol that has a line or X. You do not need to know numbers. You only need to know element name and symbol for everything that has an X. I believe there are 56 total that you need to know. All right, let's look at the schedule before we get started today in the actual notes. So this schedule, I've worked on this quite a while. I feel like it's pretty um, much going to stay this way. If we find out later it's not, then I'll definitely let you know. Sometimes there are things that need to change, but I believe overall this will be how it stays. So hopefully um, you can follow along. Notice I, if you printed this in color, I have highlighted all of the due dates for either exams or achieve homeworks so hopefully you can keep up with those easily good idea would be to go ahead and put those in your planner on your phone however you keep up with due dates so that you have those readily available to you and then no excuses for not getting things turned in on time the um, deadline for dropping with the W is on March 28th that's a late deadline so you should have plenty of knowledge on whether or not you should drop or not at that point because you had two exams and what is that five homeworks at that point so you should easily know whether you're going to make it in chemistry at that point you can see on the syllabus i am very very specific on what we're going to be doing each day this is honestly more for me than it is for you all so that i can make sure that we cover all the material we need to cover and this allows me to have 
that in front of me to know, okay, well, I didn't get through this today. I'll get through it on next day, etc. So just out of curiosity, if you are curious, the number here on the left-hand side, we have 28 course days, and that's what that is. There's 28 course days, and then these are the actual dates. Like I said, chances are you're not going to use the book, but if you want to use the book, this is the information from that first free textbook I gave you. All right, so hopefully you understand. If not, then you can talk to me about it on Tuesday, or I'm sorry, today is Tuesday, you can, or you can talk to me on Thursday, rather. So let's get started with actual chemistry. Let's get started with the course material. Well, I lied. Let's do one more thing first. Let's talk about lab real quick. Chemistry 106 lab is the co-requisite. This is the chemistry lab manual. If you do not have this, you must have this before lab and lab starts next week. If you are in the Wednesday lab, I actually will be your teacher. If you are in the Monday or Tuesday lab sections, I will not be your teacher, but the Wednesday lab section, I am the teacher. But this is the lab manual that you need. I'm gonna just kinda scroll down here just so that you can see what it looks like. You need to get this at the bookstore. Please do not get it anywhere else but the bookstore because you need this exact lab manual. So make sure that you get this at the bookstore. Have this next week when you go to lab. Make certain to have it next week when you go to lab. Also, you need goggles. And the goggles that I have are, honestly, they're kind of the fancy goggles just because I got them for free. You may buy these goggles. These cost, I think, about $15 through maybe $20 now, actually. Um, and you, the chemistry department does sell these. If you want these, they're very comfortable. They don't fog up as much as some of the other ones do. But you don't have to have the fancy ones. You can actually just get a pair of splash goggles at Walmart, and they would be much cheaper. You may not use safety glasses you do have to have goggles so make sure that you get goggles all right now i believe we're ready to go the first thing i want to just briefly talk about is the scientific method scientific method is something that is taught in every science class that i ever had in college and in high school especially biology biology always talked about scientific method I don't do much with scientific method. In fact, I'm just going to basically say to you, these are the steps that, and, this, and the steps don't even have to be the same every time. But these are the general steps, the general process of the scientific method. And so I want to just mention just briefly a scenario. Let's say that in class, we have a student who is cranky. They come in on Thursday, for instance, and they sit down in their seat and they slam their papers down, their books down. They jerk their chair out and sit down and just are huffing and puffing. And you can just tell they're kind of a cranky person. One of those people that you know when you're looking at them, you don't want to get on their bad side because they're not going to be friendly to you. Well, you could say, and, and dealing with human subjects is really tricky and hard, but we could say, we've got a problem. And, and, and I'm, obviously, if somebody's cranky once, it's not a big deal. What I'm talking about is this person's been this way all semester long. We're halfway through the semester, and we're just like, this person is just abrasive. You can't do anything without this person growling or giving you the death stare. And so we've observed that we have a problem. And our question is, what is wrong? What is going on with this person that has made them so cranky? And is there anything we can do to help? And so we have observed a situation. Now, most of the time in my experience with other science classes, scientific method was taught as if it only applied to a chemistry or biology or physics problem. But guys, most of our problems don't revolve around a laboratory situation. 
In fact, I would venture to say if we didn't have people problems, we would have a whole lot less problems. Most of our problems revolve around people because we're complex beings and we have a lot of baggage that we carry, both good and bad, to every situation we are in. So people are probably our biggest problem. So can we use the scientific method to help us solve people problems? And my response is yes, we can. So how? Well, we have observed. We've got the student in class who's cranky. So how do we research this topic? Well, we have to basically make some observations. We've got to observe. That's, and that's where we have a question and observation comes in both together. And that's really what the research here is. We have to observe, and we've observed all semester long that this person comes in this way. But we also observe the person looks tired. We observe that the person looks uh, like they haven't freshly showered recently. That's not that they stink crazily. It's just that they maybe they've come from work. And so we do a little bit of research, and we start talking to people who know them, we start, maybe we see them getting out of their car. Maybe we have a friend who knows them and we find out that they are working at UPS as a preload supervisor or just as a preloader, let's just say as a preloader. And wow, what does that mean? Well, that means that they're getting up at about two o'clock in the morning and our class starts at 935 so they've been up since about two, loading boxes onto a truck off of a conveyor belt. Whoa, now, do we have some, do we have a more clear answer of what's going on? So what could we say? We could say, well, they're tired, they're hungry, they haven't had time to eat breakfast, they get off work at nine, and they basically just barely have time to get to campus and find a parking spot. Sure, there's a break, but that break that they had was at five or six o'clock, and they've exerted a lot of energy in the last five hours. I'd say they're tired and hungry. Now, we form a hypothesis. We can't do anything about tired. We, we cannot solve their tired problem. And we can't give them money to, you know, get, stop working. We can't do that. What can we do? Yes, we can feed them. We can offer them something to eat. So our hypothesis then is an educated guess as to what's going on. So my hypothesis in this situation is that our student is hungry. Okay, how do we test this ex with experimentation? Well, if we're brave enough, we can offer them maybe a protein bar. We could, maybe we're not brave enough to offer it to them. Maybe we're going to be eating a protein bar and then we set a protein bar on their desk and then by them seeing we're eating it, maybe they'll get the hint, I gave this to you. So we do that and we keep watching and in my crazy scenario here, I'm going to analyze the data saying our student appreciated the food. Our, appreciated, our student appreciated the food and they were happy to have it. And lo and behold, they start getting nicer every day because we have given them food to eat and now they have a better attitude. They're not mad at us every day. They're not coming into class storming and fussing because they've actually had a little bit of food and they start to calm down. So our conclusion is that our hypothesis was correct, our student was hungry, and our experiment worked with positive results because the student was able to eat a little bit and they were performing better in class because of the food that was given to them and they were in a much better mood. So now that's a crazy scenario that I've just described, but in all honesty, it's probably a real life scenario. I actually happened to work at UPS a year ago and it's exhausting. So if you haven't done that, you should all try that sometime. So on our test, scientific method, I may have one question on scientific method on your test. 
There is going to be a, an assessment at the end of the semester where you will have some questions on scientific method. So kind of keep refreshing yourself on that and also try it sometime. Use the scientific method in your own life and see if it works to help you solve problems. I think you'll be surprised at how it works. All right, so where are we going to spend most of our time this week and next week? We're going to spend it on learning how to use numbers, manipulate numbers, solve problems, and measure in our chemistry lecture as well as we're working on that and learning how to do it for our chemistry lab. So our first topic is significant figures. Significant figures are probably one of the most misunderstood topics in chemistry because most teachers don't know how to explain them well enough and it's taken me a long time to figure it out. So let me give you the definition first and then we're going to talk about what it's all about. So what are significant figures? By definition, significant figures are those digits in a measured number that are known with certainty plus the first uncertain digit. I apologize, my table is moving. So if you see this jumping a bit, I'm sorry. So again, those digits in a measured number that are known with certainty plus the first uncertain digit. So right now, that doesn't necessarily mean anything to you because you don't understand what certainty and uncertain mean. So what is it about? It's about an instrument. What are we dealing with here? We're dealing with measured numbers, strictly measured numbers. In order to have a measured number, you must have an instrument. So the purpose of significant figures is to show how an instrument looks. It's all about a measuring instrument. What does the instrument look like? How is it calibrated? How is it calibrated? In other words, where are the marks on the instrument? That's what we're dealing with. Where are the marks on the instrument? How is it calibrated? How an instrument is calibrated is how we know the certain digit. So certainty is how calibrated, how the marks are, what, where the marks are. Certainty on a measured number is how the instrument is calibrated. The first uncertain digit is the guessed number. So it's how it's calibrated plus the first guess. The first guessed number is the uncertain digit. We're going to look at some instruments to show you, for to make sure you understand this. But before we go to the instruments to look at them, let's talk about some numbers do not use significant figures. So we have some numbers that have an infinite number of significant figures. So we do not use significant figures at all for those. They are called exact numbers. So numbers that do not have significant figures are exact numbers. Some numbers such as defined quantities are exact. And for instance, it is defined that three feet is equal to one yard. That is a defined quantity. That neither one of those, three or one, have any significant figures attached to them because you are not measuring that. That is a defined quantity. Another defined quantity that is one that you're supposed to be memorizing, which is one that people don't, they can't understand that it's defined, but it is truly defined, is 2.54 centimeters are in one inch. Exactly. 2.54 centimeters are in one inch. That is a defined quantity. No significant figures are attached to those 
defined quantities. If you look back on your syllabus, on the page where I gave you conversion factors, and I say to you exact numbers, these have no significant figures attached to them. That's why it says exact numbers mean do not use significant figures. Not exact mean do use significant figures. So 454 grams equals one pound. This is a measured number and it, this is a rounded number. So it does not have we do, it does have significant figures. So you would say for this one, it has three significant figures. This has three significant figures, and this has three significant digits. The ones, of course, do not have significant digits because it's in exactly one. Where am I getting these three? Well, the three are because each of these are non-zero digits. I'll explain that in a moment, so just hang on. All right, who else does not have significant figures attached? And they are counted numbers. So exact numbers are counted numbers and defined quantities. They have no significant figures attached to them. That's what we're talking about here. Counted numbers are anything that is counted. So anything counted. So if I say I have one student in my classroom today, then that is a counted number and I don't have any significant figures associated with that number. If I say I have 35 students in my classroom, that is also a counted number and so I don't have any significant figures. So the number of people, money is also counted. So money will not have significant figures attached to it either. So anything that is counted, if I say I see one red cardinal outside right now in the snow, that is, doesn't have any significant figures to do with it because I counted the cardinal. So what has significant figures? Something that is measured. Anything that is measured, a number that is measured will have significant figures. So it says on this note, use thermometers to indicate precision and significant figures. See last page of notes. So you should have printed out, hopefully you did, this page that shows three thermometers. And we have a picture of three thermometers and it says measuring temperature with various degrees of precision. And this should say degree Celsius. So each of these thermometers is measuring temperature in degrees Celsius. And if you look at the thermometers, Hopefully, immediately, you see something different about the thermometers. Who are the same here? Which thermometers are the same? A and B. A and B are the same. Which thermometer is different? C is different. So as far as precision is concerned, A and B are less precise than C. Why is C the more precise? That's right, because it has more calibration marks. These marks are how the instrument is calibrated. So let's measure our temperature in these thermometers using proper significant figures. Now let me raise that back up again just one more time so that you can see it. So we have a 20 down at the bottom and we have a 30. So we're measuring this temperature of the thermometer and it's between 20 and 30. That means each of these marks is one. Each of these marks is one. So what do we know with certainty is the temperature? Let me get that focused in for you. Not focusing real well, is it right now? There we go. What do we know with certainty is the temperature for thermometer A? We know with certainty it is 21. With certainty it is 21 degrees. Significant digits, let's go back to our definition. Significant digits is those digits in a measured number that are known with certainty plus the first uncertain digit. 
with certainty, we have two significant digits, the two and the one. Then we have to pick an uncertain digit. This is how the instrument was calibrated. What is my uncertain digit? It is a guess. What is my guess? Well, I have to make a good guess. Where does this go to? It's not up to 22. It's not even halfway there. So we could say it is, I'm going to make a good guess, and I'm going to say it's 21.2 degrees Celsius. So my certain digits are the 2 and the 1. My uncertain digit is the 2 tenths. So how many total significant digits do I have? And we also often call these sig figs. Total significant figures is three because all three are significant. All three of these are significant. So I have total of three significant digits. I have two that are certain and one that is uncertain with three total significant figures. All right, let's go to thermometer B. Thermometer B, it's calibrated exactly the same as A. So this would be 20, 21, 22. So we know with certainty it is 22 degrees. And then we look and we say it is exactly on the line. It's not above it. It's not below it. It's exactly on the line. But significant figures say those digits in a measured number that are known with certainty. So we know these are known with certainty plus the first uncertain digit. Well, there isn't anything uncertain. It's on the line. How do we tell the reader that? What do we put to tell the reader it's exactly on the line. A point zero, very good. A point zero, we put a point zero because that is telling our readers that this is exactly on the line. I would have told you if it were above the line or below the line, but it is exactly on the line. And so it's 22.0. By placing the zero here, you are saying the instrument is calibrated in ones, and I'm guessing at the tenths because it's exactly on the line, I put a zero. How many total significant digits? We also have three total significant digits. Why? Because the zero is significant. So we have three total significant figures. Let me go back again and just comment on how the instrument's calibrated. We've already said the instrument was calibrated in ones, every one degree. These numbers confirm that. How the instrument is calibrated is what we know with certainty. So both of these thermometers are calibrated in ones and we guess at the tenths place calibrated in ones guess at the tenths place for a and b c is more precise and that is not the case for c so let's look at c. Let's read this instrument properly what do we know with certainty? Well, first of all, how is this instrument calibrated? Let's talk about that first. It is calibrated in what? Tenths. It is calibrated in tenths. That's correct. It's calibrated in tenths. How do we know that? Because there is a little line between the ones place. There's another line showing 10 spaces between each one, that means there is an actual calibration mark at the tenths. So if it is calibrated in the tenths, then what do we guess at? 
That's right. We guess at the hundredths. We guess at the hundredths. If it's calibrated in tenths, then we guess at the hundredths. So now let's see if we can read it. So it's known with certainty 21, 22, and yes, it is. You got to look closely. Yes, though, it is above, slightly above that line. So it's known with certainty to be 22.1 with certainty. It is 22.1. Then the question becomes, well, is it 22.11? Is it 22.12? That's really hard to tell because it's just barely above the line. What do we want to say? 22.12. 22.12 degrees Celsius. Whoops, I forgot to put degrees Celsius over here. Always put a unit. Always put a unit. So which ones do we know with certainty? How many? First three. Good. First three we know with certainty. And what is our uncertain digit? The two. The two is uncertain. And how is and we guessed at the hundredths place, which is uncertain. Your guessed at is the uncertain spot. So let's take the knowledge you've just gained from actually seeing an instrument and reverse that with just numbers, measured numbers. So let's look at measured numbers. And you tell me how were the instruments calibrated that measured these numbers. So in the first example, it's got 30.875 meters. So let's go back to our definition. Those digits in a measured number that are known with certainty plus the first uncertain digit. So what is our uncertain digit in this measurement? The 5. The 5 is uncertain. Uncertain means you guessed at it. That is not how the instrument was calibrated. How the instrument is calibrated is the last certain digit. So the last certain digit is the 7 in this case, which means the seven is in what place value? Hundredths. So how was this instrument calibrated? It was calibrated in hundredths. The certain number is how it's calibrated. That means this instrument was calibrated in hundredths of a meter. Now, I just realized I probably need to do some refreshing on place value with you guys. So let's real quickly look at place value, okay? I'm going to put those X's and then turn my paper here a bit. Ones, tens, hundreds. What's this one then on the other side of the decimal called? Tenths. Then what? Hundredths, thousandths. So when I ask the question of how something is calibrated, that's what I want. I want to know ones, tens, tenths, hundredths. That's what I'm asking for. How an instrument is calibrated, that's what I want, is the place value that it's calibrated in. So let's look at the next one, 13.00 grams. How is this instrument calibrated? Tenths, that's correct. It's calibrated in tenths. How do we know that? Because our last certain digit is the next to the last written digit. So the one I've underlined is certain and that's how the instrument is calibrated. The one that is underlined, that it's the next to the last digit. Folks, go to the bottom of this page and look at what I wrote. Always remember, 
The last number is the uncertain, the guess. It's not certain, it's guessed at. The number before the last number is the last mark on the instrument, meaning how the instrument is calibrated. That's how the instrument is calibrated. The last mark is how the instrument is calibrated. So let's go back up, 100.0 liters, 100.0 liters. What is uncertain? I'm going to ask a different question. What is uncertain? Which zero? The last zero. The zero after the decimal is the uncertain. So the zero prior to the decimal is the last certain digit, which means it is the one that shows us the calibration mark. How was this instrument calibrated? In ones, very good. The instrument was calibrated in ones. All right, the next problem is a little different. 250 miles with a decimal, but nothing after the decimal. You don't see numbers this way very often. So what's going on here? Why do we have a number like this here? Well. It tells us how the instrument's calibrated. Now, I'm throwing in something that we're not going to talk about today, but it's important to be able to explain it a little bit here. And actually, we may talk about it today because Thursday, I probably will go ahead and talk about it today. It's zero. What do we do with these zeros? Well, there's a rule for zero, and we're going to get to that on the next page. But I'm going to go ahead and tell you the rule, then we'll go through them again. If there is a zero with a decimal, if you've got a zero at the end of a number, and there is a decimal at the end of the number, then this zero is a significant digit. So it is significant, but that does not mean it's the way the instrument was calibrated. If it is a significant figure, then it is the uncertain significant figure. That means the last certain significant digit is the five. That's right, it's the five. The zero is not certain. The five is certain. The zero is significant, but it's uncertain. It's uncertain. The zero is uncertain. I'm going to put uncertain zero. But the five is certain. That means this instrument was calibrated how? That's correct. It was calibrated in tens. Now, this is kind of an odd scenario. I'll give you the scenario for this. Imagine you're driving down the interstate, and you know how there's mile markers every mile or so? Usually it's every mile on the interstate. Okay, imagine you're driving in Kansas, and it's just long Nevada, long straight stretches of, of straight road, and they only put their mile markers every 10 miles. So every 10 miles, you have a mile marker. You happen to stop at the 250th mile marker. You would write it, I am at 250 point miles. Because you're exactly, and it's calibrated every 10 miles. If you went halfway between the 250 and the 250, or I'm sorry, the 250 mile marker and the 260 mile marker, you would say I'm at 255 miles, and there's no decimal because the five is significant no matter what. Again, it's the rule for zero I'm going to get to in just a minute. But in this case, that's where you would use that decimal at the end of a number, even though there's nothing else after the decimal. Now, the next scenario is even goofier. There is no decimal. The next scenario has no decimal. So what does that mean? What's it mean about the zero? It's not significant. Is it important? Yes, and that's where our problem is. We think of something as significant, it's important. Well, in, in, if you have a person in your life who is a significant person, they're an important person, but that doesn't mean in chemistry a significant figure is important or isn't important. In this case, the zero is important but not a significant figure. The zero is important because it holds the place value, but it is not a significant figure. 
which means the five is uncertain and the three is what? Certain, which means how is this instrument calibrated? Hundreds. Hundreds. Really strange, but it's calibrated in hundreds. Very unusual that it's calibrated in hundreds. If you have a quart jar at home, look at your quart jar. Very possibly, if it's a ball or a cur quart jar, it has calibrations of hundreds of milliliters. So it might have 100 milliliters, 200 milliliters, etc. Look at it and see, and if you see that, then you'll see there's a jar that's calibrated in hundreds of milliliters. And that would be how this is. It's a, it's a gallons, but it's hundreds of gallons. Would that be a large container or a small container? If it was calibrated in hundreds of gallons, very large, very large container would be calibrated in hundreds of gallons. Okay, so again, remember the last um, number is the uncertain, that's your guess, and the number before the last number is the last mark on the instrument, how, which means how the instrument is calibrated. So our next question is, who is significant? And I've kind of alluded to that here, but we're going to know the rules. So who is significant? Only measured numbers. Only measured numbers have significant figures. Remember that. Only measured numbers have significant figures. If it's not measured, it doesn't have significant figures. Now, specifically, we need to look at, if in a measured number, who is significant specifically regarding zero and non-zero digits. So let's look at these rules for zero. So all non-zero digits, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, as long as it's a measured number, are significant. So this go around, all I'm doing is counting significant figures. So let's just give you a number, 233.84 milliliters. 233.84 milliliters. And my question is, how many significant digits do we have total? Total. How many significant digits do we have? Five. We have five total significant figures. Why? Because are all of these non-zero? Yes. Now, I didn't ask how is it calibrated. I'm going to ask that now. I'm asking how many total significant digits are there? Five total. Now, how is the instrument calibrated? Well, that's the le next to the last number. How is it calibrated? What place value does that hold? Tenths. It's calibrated in tenths. It's calibrated in tenths, but we have five total significant figures. All right, let's give you another one. 35 grams. How many significant figures do we have? Two. Two significant digits. Let me just make a little comment here. The number in circled equals the number of significant figures. When I circle the number, that's the number of significant figures. So we have... Two significant digits. Now, in 35 grams, what's my in? What, what, which one is uncertain? What digit is uncertain? The five. The five is uncertain. That means that the three is certain, which means how is this instrument calibrated? Tens. It's calibrated in tens. Good. Calibrated in tens. All right, so it's zero typically that gives us the issue. So let's look at the rules for zero. First rule, zeros between non-zero digits are significant. So 808 liters. You have a zero between non-zero digits. How many total significant digits are there? Three. Three total significant digits. All right, what if you have 50 Point zero one grams. How many total significant digits do you have there? Four. That's correct. Because you have two zeros in between non-zero digits. So you have four significant digits total. While we're at it, let's talk about how these instruments were calibrated. 808. If all three of these are significant, then how was this instrument calibrated? Tens. That's very good. It's calibrated in tens. This one is calibrated in tens. 
Now, 50.01, how is it calibrated? Tenths. That's correct. It's calibrated in tenths. Calibrated in tenths. That's what this bottom part is in red, how it's calibrated. All right, zeros in front of non-zero digits are not significant. They are used to locate a decimal. Zeros in front of non-zero digits are not significant. These zeros are used to locate a decimal. So let's look at the scenario here. 0 0.54 grams. Now, first of all, let's just talk about it. Again, I mentioned important and significant. There's two scenarios here. I think in this situation, it is important for you to put the zero. Even though there's nothing else there, it's important to put the zero so that I know that decimal is not a stray mark on your paper. I know that it's truly a decimal. But is that zero a significant figure? No, it's not. So there are only two significant digits here. All right, that one's not that big of a deal. Here's where we get into the bigger issue. 0 0.0031 grams. We know this zero is just there to make sure you realize that that's a decimal. But what about these two? Are they important? Yes, absolutely, they're important because they're locating this decimal and they're telling us, hey, this is a very tiny quantity. This is a very small amount. But are they significant digits? No. Because the rule says zeros in front of non-zero digits are not significant. So how many significant digits? Two. Now, what would be a better way to write these numbers? Scientific notation. When you have a number like this, they may be best written in scientific notation. And for those of you that don't know how to do scientific notation, well, it just so happens we're going to talk about that on Thursday. But it's right below this in the notes. But let's just do this. How would this be written in scientific notation? How would you write this in scientific notation? So you would move your decimal over one, two, three places to the right. Here's your decimal. You move the decimal over one, two, three places to the right. And so we're going to put 3.1 times 10. Now how many places do we move it? One, two, three. And that's negative three because it is smaller than one. So 3.1 times 10 to the negative 3 because it's smaller than 1. How many significant digits does that show easily? 2. You see significant figures so much better here when it's in scientific notation than you do when it's in decimal notation. On this one, how would you put this one in scientific notation? Well, then the other question, I'm just going to say this. The other question is, is there any need to put this one in scientific notation to see two significant digits? Most people are going to say no. My theory on when to put something in scientific notation is if it saves room on your paper or if it clarifies significant figures, then put it in scientific notation. If it's more writing for you, then don't. And to put this one in scientific notation would be more writing. So I'm going to leave this one as it is. Later, we'll do scientific notation, a lot of it. But right now, we're going to leave it like this. All right, rule number four and five, and then we'll stop for the day. But let's look at rule four. Rule four, zeros at the end of a number that includes a decimal point are significant. Zeros at the end of a number that includes a decimal point are significant. So 80.00 liters. Zeros at the end of a number that includes a decimal point are significant. We meet all the rules. How many significant digits do we have? Four. Very good. All right. Another one, and I'm going to actually do two on this one, two more. Let's take point, 0 0.350 grams. 
0.350 grams. The zero in front is or is not significant. Is not significant. What about the zero at the end? Yes. See the difference? So how many total significant digits? Three significant digits. Three significant digits. All right. The um, last example is the one similar to what we had a few minutes ago. 350 pounds. LB is pounds. 350 LBs. 350 decimal LB. How many significant digits do we have there? Three. Why is it three? Because, tell me about that zero. It is significant. Why? Because it has the decimal. That's correct. The zero is at the end of a number that includes a decimal point. Does this include a decimal point? Yes. It's significant. So there are three significant figures there. Three significant digits there. All right, last example for zeros, or last rule for zeros is zeros at the end of a number without a decimal point are not significant. So zeros, if they have a decimal, yes. Zeros without are not significant. So let's take that same 350 pounds and leave off the decimal. And now it only has two significant digits. That's exactly right. All right, what if we have a number like this? 3,000, or I'm sorry, I'm not saying that right. Let me, let me start all over again. 3,850 grams. That's not the best one, but let's look at that one. 3,850 grams. Tell me how many significant figures are there. There's no decimal at the end. Three, that's correct. Three significant digits. Is the zero important? Yes, but it's not significant. This one isn't that big of a deal, although most people would be a little confused potentially. Here's where we find that we have the most issue. Let's take 75,200 grams. 75,200 grams. How many significant figures does that one have? Still only three. Are there zeros that are there that are insignificant? Yes. How could we write these to show more properly significant figures? Scientific notation again. So once again, we put may be best written in scientific notation. May be best written in scientific notation. So how would we write these in scientific notation? Well, let's take the first one here, 3,850. Well, even though there is no decimal after the zero, we know there is a decimal there. It's understood. So we move our decimal one, two, three places to the left. That makes it 3.85. We aren't putting that zero because it's not significant, times 10 to the positive three grams because it's a number larger than one. And that shows very easily three significant digits. And how would we write 75,200? How many places are we going to move it over? How many? Count again. Correct. Four is correct. Four places. Good. So we move that over to four places. 7.52. Do we include those two zeros? No. 7.52 times 10 to the, what do we say again? Four, positive four, because it's a large number, grams. Does that show clearly three significant digits? Very good. All right, we're going to stop right here, and we will pick up with scientific notation and any questions you have about this material on Thursday. Also, there is another video on my YouTube channel. If you want to look at it, that includes more information about significant figures, if that's still confusing you. Um, I would encourage you to watch it. It's just a little short one, and that extra practice worksheet is under YouTube videos and worksheets on Blackboard. So you guys have a great day, and stay warm. Talk to you on Thursday.